All right, welcome back to the program. Olabode Shomi is with me right here at the table. Olabode Shomi is a consultant to the House on Power and the Senate on Gas. Welcome to the program. The, 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 the last time we spoke was when we had that rowdy public hearing. Was it earlier this year? That was January. January, yeah. Have we made so much progress? How, how much progress have we made from that time till now? I think to the extent that the goal is to pass the bill, and that the fact that the bill has been passed, albeit um, separate versions in both houses, those are significant milestones. And I think um, if we're going to use a comparison of timing, this is the quickest that the bill has been passed in any of the times that it has been passed. So we could say that all stakeholders are agreeing to the fact that the bill is perhaps the singularly most important thing that has happened in the industry in the last 20 years. Mm. It's a 20-year journey, though we saw uh, a 2008 journey too. Uh, we saw the president refusing to ascend. I think that was in 2018 or so, or 2019. 2019. 2019. And then now the, the bill coming in and there was an executive bill. Um, how would you take a look at that transition? Uh, bearing in mind that it came as an ominous bill, then got separated into four bills. Yes. But now it's a consolidated bill, yeah. isn't it? I think... So take ta ta us through it, especially in simple terms, and what Nigerians... I want Nigerians to be able to understand what this bill means, because it's filled with a lot of technical stuff, and a lot of you guys analyze it <laughs> with a lot of technical <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so I don't want to go on that <laughs> path. You know, so let's explain it in simple terms. That that person in in worry, or that person in Delta, that person in Aquaibom that is watching us right now, say, "Can I don't pass their bill now?" But waiting, we go get so that they will understand the implication of this. Yeah, I think uh, first of all, w um, we the laws that exist now, that's pre the PIB, are laws from the 50s, and um, obviously technology of the 50s when oil was discovered. Uh, without a regulator, without the dynamics in the market, we're not quite satisfactory. So with the advent of democracy in 2000, the idea of an omnibus bill that would revamp the structure of the industry was presented, and it was presented via the PIB. However, varying interests misunderstood the intent, the purpose of the bill, at least in terms of the good that it would do. And there was resistance from all quarters. There was resistance initially even from the IOCs, there was resistance, obviously, from the host communities. There was resistance from uh, what we can call the Northern Group, the understanding of those within the North. There was nonchalance from some of the people in the South and all that. But one of the first things, first impact that he had was that a lot of international companies stopped investment in Nigeria as a new investment. And whether by accident or incident, those money weren't going to be idle for long. And it was during that period that they started discovering oil or gas in other parts of the, the world, uh, in Africa. It was during the period we discovered gas in Tanzania. Oil, Uganda has oil. Yes, yeah. oil in Uganda, oil in Ghana, oil in Liberia, and all that. And incidentally, those were monies that originally should have been destined for Nigeria. As the biggest producer on the continent. As the biggest and as a proven mm. environment. Because normally, when you look at investors, as much as entrepreneurs seem to be risk-friendly, they, they actually they, they calculate their risk. So why would I, as an investor, carry a billion dollars to go and explore an unproven field when I have a problem field in Nigeria, the only thing that will make that is because the fiscals and the structure of the environment is uncertain. And it is that uncertainty that was presented by the lack of the passage of the PIB. So basically, people wanted to see the bill mm -hmm. and how the bill will work as an act. So they delayed their investment pending the passage of the bill. So four years goes, they don't pass the bill. So the people have to take their money somewhere else. So unfortunately, we didn't quite get that, mm. the reality of that. Because one of the things that have necessitated and made it a condition, I think, with respect to passing the bill, is the fact that virtually everybody in leadership is made to realize the impact, what is actually being lost. 
to the nation as a result of not passing the bill. Do you think that with this recent development, with what happened yesterday, do you see energy invest investment returning back to the country? Let me put it into perspective. Uh, into perspective, $70 billion came into the continent in terms of investment in 2020. Yeah. Um, Nigeria just got about $9.68 billion of that $70 billion. And out of that $9.86 billion that we got as investment into the country, just a paltry sum of about $53 million came into the energy industry, into Nigeria. So it's a no-brainer. If you take a look at that $70 billion into Africa, about 4% came to Nigeria. So do you think that this, the passage of this bill has, will now unlock that, the investment opportunities, especially in the sector that produces about 70% of our FX earnings, but less than 10% or around 10% to GDP. And if you see that it will unlock that investment, which we hit at to seek, how long do you think that between from now till when the president was assigned to the bill, from what time to what time should we begin to see investments coming in? I think um, it's not an act until it's an act. Mm. So for an act of signing paper, <laughs> 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 an act of Mr. <laughs> President. <laughs> yes. So uh, when Mr. President puts his signature to paper, then the next day is an act. But I mean, that is not to discountenance the significant progress that has been made. What I expect will happen is that everybody is watching. I mean, virtually every informal channel was being explored in the last 24 hours to get versions versions of the bill that were passed in both House and Senate. So everybody who is a stakeholder or who is a friend to a stakeholder, is connected to a stakeholder, is hearing about PIB, is analyzing it, and very soon you can be having people having BSc in PIB. So, but, but the point I'm making is that I expect that, and I believe very strongly, that those who are in a position to make investment decisions are studying what is happening. And how soon that will happen will be dependent on a number of factors. For those who are established here, like the IOCs, who already have um, maps, who already have um, decisions that they will make, I expect that we should expect decisions in the, in the next 24 months, decisions that would lead to actual money coming. For those who are not that established, it's going to vary. It's going to vary on the capacity of the stakeholders who are operators to be able to influence and make their presentation. But the good thing is that it's always a good reference for anybody to say, hey, Chevron is investing here, Shell is investing here, and I'm investing next door. As against Chevron is here, they're not investing. Shell is here, they're not investing. But what I will happen for the real companies that have said they are leaving? Uh, decisions can always be changed. You think they, can, they will come back? No, f first of all, they didn't really leave in that sense. I mean, I'm, I want to yeah, believe you're talking about Shell. Yeah. No, what, what Shell did was divest in mm. onshore assets. They divested in their onshore assets. But let's, let's, let, let's just look at the economics, basically. Uh, for onshore assets, you're looking at 20,000 barrels, 30,000 barrels per day, right? And you have a cluster of them. For offshore assets, you are looking at 300,000 barrels per day, 350,000 barrels per day, and the like. So why do I want to spend so much energy dealing with uterestiveness, um, community issues, and all the related for 20,000 barrels per day, which may and may not cover my investment inputs within a certain time, as against this um, pipe that is going on. So basically, they are, they are basically economics. But more importantly, the, the, the gathering system that everybody who has an oil well in that route uses still belongs to Shell. They have not sold that asset. Mm. So the, the, the truth is that we just need to just look a bit more. You know, wha what has happened was that you have had a PR person coin the words in such a way that it passes a certain message. Because when at the end of the day, they're going to tell you they never said they were divesting out of Nigeria. They were divesting from their onshore assets out of the country. So, so basically, 
I mean, they, they would look at their interests and all that, and then, but for, for even for the divestments, it has also brought opportunities for a lot of indigenous, indigenous companies mm -hmm. who are doing fine. I mean, Falcon is a, is a fantastic example. Seplat is now a total integrated services company and all that, and all those opportunities would never have been there. Midwestern is another one, would never have been there if there were no divestments. And for all these companies, 5,000 barrels per day, 10,000 barrels per day is El Dorado. I mean, for Shell, that may not be enough to make an investment decision. So we have to look at the fact that the industry itself is growing. And there's actually a need for the industry to grow. Because when we talk about the contribution to GDP, it also has to do with the enlargement and the development of the market, particularly the domestic market. And then when you talk about people not repeating the same issues that they have, that we had in oil, in gas, we're just talking about development mm -hmm. of local capacity. Because if you look at the oil that Norway had, one of the reasons why oil was not a curse in Norway, and is the only nation in the world that has such significant resources that it was not a curse, was because the money for oil was never used in the economy. Yeah. It's so been I'm saved and they have a huge sovereign wealth fund. Exactly. What have you. Because they actually used it in yeah. the economy for about nine months. And the economy was that's in the 70s. And it was, it was uh, turning spiral, so they stopped it. So that they wouldn't give people a wrong impression of the capacity of the economy. So basically, all the money that Start Oil and the, um, the parents, um, the one that bought over Start Oil, have, has been put in the sovereign wealth fund. So the economy is running as it will probably run like any other Scandinavian country. They are good in their manufacturing, they are good in their IT systems and all that. But they now have this sovereign wealth fund, which is basically the money from oil. oil. They don't put it in the country so that people, so they even, they, they, they invest. They invest I think they said that close to 10% or so of global shares belongs to the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund. And, and then there is also, it's also used for the pension for those who are not working. And the pension of Norway is a legend in the investment world community because it's significantly huge. It's part of the investment. So basically, when we have this oil, and the oil itself is money that is not coming from productive work, is what causes the, what we know as the Dutch, Dutch disease. The Dutch disease. Mm. So what we are now saying is that, yes, we have had an intricated system that just allows us to use oil. But rather than just using it or using gas as it is, let us develop the local capacity so that there will be industries that are actually using gas and all that, so that those industries themselves, they will produce jobs, they will now contribute genuinely to, PD, to the GDP, and then the, the Dutch disease aspect can be eliminated. It's a journey, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. When do you think that the president was assigned to this since it's like an executive is an executive bill that it seems the politics is, is similarly out because if the politics was still there it may not have been signed yesterday that's one question the second question is that of NNPC it will cease to exist as it is now Mele Carey and his group <laughs> may go, <laughs> go into another company so we'll cease uh, NNPC will cease to exist as a regulatory body and operations and um NNPC reminds me of a Saudi Aramco, or what it should be ordinarily. We saw in 2019 Saudi Aramco selling 3 billion shares, 1.5% of the company. Uh, I think it sold it then, I remember I talked about it then, about 32 reals, which is equivalent to about $8.53 as at when they, they sold it. They made about $25.6 billion from, from the IPO. Just I think about two months ago, I also heard the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia says they want to sell another additional 1%. Because their, their intention then, I think, was to raise $100 billion. They, they couldn't. But Saudi Aramco, I think, is valued at around, uh, is in the trillions, though, of, of dollars. Where I'm going to right now is that the structure of the NNPC, the way it is, uh, would we see, a, uh, definitely we'll see a PLC if they do it well listed on the exchange and what other companies do we see emanating 
are from, from yeah from the NMPC. Also the regulatory side, because from the bill I understand that you have two regulators, two regulators one from for the upstream and for downstream. Why two regulators really? Especially with the experience of bureaucracy that we have in Nigeria, I do know there are a lot of many fuel stations right now. <laughs> do you understand that perhaps one can argue that okay you need one regulator for downstream and another regulator for for upstream. I hope you. I well, agree I with all stuff yeah. I've asked. Okay, so yeah. let's start with the first. It's an executive bill. What that means is that the initiative is from the executive. So the way the National Assembly runs, or the way is that um, laws are initiated from two sides, either from the executive or from the National Assembly itself, that's from the legislature. Now, when they emanate from the legislature, they need to be technically sold to the executive for them to buy into the ethos of that bill and for them to append the signature, uh, the signature of the president. Otherwise, it can be returned to the legislature. But of course, when the executive initiates a bill, the executive will now, on his own hand, try to sell the ethos of that bill to the legislature. So what it means is that there's no selling or persuasion that is needed with the executive because it is their own interest ab initio. So now that the people that need to be sold into the bill is the uh, National Assembly, who at this point have now passed it. So what is happening, what's going to happen next week is, um, is a technical thing, but it's an important thing. It's just basically to look at the dots, um, the eyes, cross the, I mean, dot the eyes and cross the T's. Um, one or two areas had different percentages. There will be an agreement at the point of do you mean the host community stuff, 3 yes. and 5 percent? Yes, the host community stuff and all that. So there will be an agreement and a merger at when the two, when the joint committee sits. Once the joint committee comes out with a final document, which is going to be reflective of both houses, it will now be sent back to both houses as a new document, and that will now be passed. There will be a second passage of it. Now, so there will now With be a harmonized a, yes, the harmonized bill will now be passed in both houses. Then it will now be sent as a document through the clerk of the National Assembly to the president. To the president. It is expected that within a week it will be s signed because I mean the whole world. It's not just the nation; the whole world is waiting to to have that signed. And then the next day, we we'll have an act. I mean, it follows the bureaucracy to be gazetted and all those kind of things. With respect to the, the NMPC. NMPC. We've had this discussion before. I'm also one of those that didn't believe that the NMPC as it con currently configured is the best thing to happen because you cannot be both a regulator and a player in a free market. So it's like CBN itself running a, a bank. commercial bank. It's, I mean, if there's any definition of unfair advantage, that would be it. But it is what it is. It was not like it was configured to be that way. It was an evolution that over time we saw to be that way. And then there were the issues with Nigeria and all that. But, and that is why this bill is important. Why is it even relevant to the man on the street and all that? The first thing it means is that NMPC and the industry can be structured in a way that there's greater transparency. If there was any industry that is opaque is the and gas industry. It's not the health industry, it's not but the it's city. it's like all over the world though, somehow, to an extent. Yes, Like a cartel, don't you see OPEC, cartel. You want to say OPEC, <laughs> or a cartel. <laughs> the, there are cartels everywhere. There mm. are cartels in the health industry, globally. There are cartels in the food industry, globally. There are cartels in the ICT industry, globally. There are cartels, you know, there are cartels everywhere. Mm. But what we are talking about now is a structure of transparency in the cartel yes for engaging the system you know when we talk cartels we're talking about ownership all industries have people that own them i mean most people don't like to hear that but that's a reality everywhere in the world industries have people who own them they have companies a range of companies so we're talking about the 80 20 principle now where 20 percent of the people own 80% of the industry or 20% of the people do 80% of the work, that kind of thing. So the people who technically own the industry can be called a cartel because they really don't, they're not readily welcoming people inside 
as well. So, but, but that's a different issue, politics mm -hmm. and economics. But the point I'm trying to make is that for, for the industry, in terms of people engaging it, in terms of people getting transparent information out of it, all that is going to change. What, when, do you see, wh wh when do you hope to see that transition, especially for uh, NNPC and the likes and getting regulators? Uh, well, from when the president will sign? Yes. Yeah, when do you hope to see that transition? Also, bearing in mind that there would be two regulators now. The with authority and the commission. Y y sorry? The, the authority, authority and the commission, and the commission. yes. And with this now, Nigerians should be getting ready that whether we like it or not, subsidy has to go. Because, yeah, in no time. Mm. Because market forces will come to play. You know, so at what, just speak to around this. You know, f first of all, you know, we, we run a very unique, opaque subsidy system. And that is why there's so much debate about subsidy. Because up until today, Nobody really, really knows how to verify the landing price that we are giving. We are told the landing price is this. That's what we are told. So if you were to verify the computation, which is actually simple maths, there's no way to verify it. When there is a regulator, you can actually hold the regulator responsible for that, even though that can be done by another arm. So the first thing is that there are fundamentals that determine pricing. I am not one of those that necessarily believe that when the process is transparent and subsidies removed, that pricing will go high. It may not. It may not. It may, and it may not. Because when you look at the old subsidy regime, the moment uh, petrol, crude petrol goes, I mean, crude oil goes lower in price, you should expect a it corresponding. Down. But it doesn't. No, but it came down at least last year. The pump price was down a bit, I think twice. Yes. Yeah, when oil price went down. But, but that's another yes, issue. Yes, I know. The really? yeah. so, but the point I'm trying to make is that uh, once we have greater transparency, a lot of things are going to change. Mm. A lot of things are going to change. And transparency is actually more relevant than even the free market. Because even if you have a socialist structure and there's transparency, there's less tendency for corruption. Like what we're seeing in Venezuela. Venezuela is such a, a good example yeah. of an oil economy and what is happening mm -hmm. right now. The UAE well, is also another example. Yeah, Let, let's, uh, because I have less than three minutes with you because I have another guest. Let's take a look at the issue of uh, host communities. You know, the bus bus <laughs> that we saw in January. Do you think that uh, or the host communities are, will be happy uh, with this? That's one. The question of also petroleum equalization I'm seemingly not clear, or perhaps my thought is that there won't be need for it again. The DPR definitely is a regulator. What other issue do I really want to uh, put into than environmental concerns, really? So those three. Um, first of all, environmental concerns, let me start from that, will fall squarely on the hands of the regulator. You know, basically, and uh, this is the example I like using. The, the power sector cannot compare in terms of investment to what the oil and gas industry has. But the power sector is significantly more structured despite all its issues mm. and the myriad of issues. And one quick way that you note it is how there are responses to when, uh, this, when somebody from outside queries the system. Uh, if, if there's an electrocution, God forbid, of anyone, there is the system where NEC is informed next set up a panel, mm -hmm. they invite the host, the families of those concerned, and they invite the discos, a report comes out, the families get compensated, and a copy is sent to the National Assembly for them to be aware as the committees. If there's a cylinder gas explosion, nobody even knows who to talk to. So thi this would definitely... Th yes, so that's an absence mm -hmm. of a regulator. That's one of the issues that happen because there's really nobody to hold rep responsible for regulatory issues. And when people cannot be held responsible for faults, there is no in, in incentive to make corrections and improve the system. So when people can correct the system, once they can improve the system, the system automatically becomes better. And that is why it's such a good thing. It's not about the people per se, it's mm. about the system working. So it's basically systems thinking. About the host communities, I think it's not about whether they are happy, it's about whether it's what is best for them. 
Because right now, you're going to have a funding that is going to be uh, programmed, that is going to have a schedule, and that is going to be directed at the people. So it's not directed at individuals, but directed at the people. As per the percentages, I don't think it's the percentages which per se that matter. It is the value that comes with those percentages. So if you have 50% and it translates to 10 million, and you have 3% and, and it translates... hundred million. Exactly. So it's the amount. So at the percentage of what is available to the industry, what you have now is even more than what goes into the NDDC. And that would also be determined with what's happening in the economy and also what's happening in the market environment at that time for those companies to make Exactly. Money. So that everybody is interested mm -hmm. in a system that is working. Okay. I think we'll leave it at that. So many issues to talk about, but we'll continue to, to, to look at that. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you, Nancy. I've been speaking with Olabo Deshomi, who is a consultant to the House uh, Committee on Power and the Senate Committee on Gas.